had an interesting phenomenon that took place that ended up coinciding with a high tide coming in and the way that Nagasaki City is set up. As we saw the high tide take place and the fluctuation of the atmospheric pressure, we had some water that ended up running over and into the city. Take a look at this video, give you an idea of what it looked like on the ground. Almost looks like as if it rained really hard, but it's not. This rapid fluctuation in sea levels ended up inundating some parts of the city Thursday night, and so residents had to be on alert because of that high tide coming in around that time along with the water coming in. Sometimes this happens and it lasts anywhere from several minutes to even up to well, close to an hour at times because of changes in atmospheric pressure and along with some other factors. And so yeah, the sea level surged up by one meter that caused the seawater to overflow embankments and flooded parts of the city. Now, as we look at the map, when it comes to the weather, it should be remaining dry. So as long as we see that water seeping back out into the ocean, we should see things starting to dry back up. Now, when we look toward the north and east, we had some precipitation hitting the northern areas of Japan and along the Sea of Japan side of the country. And we had a little bit of a disturbance near Tokyo, so we had some clouds rolling in. But hey, we started off on this Friday with some really warm weather that felt close to more like May in terms of high temperatures. And we are looking at a big cool down because the cold front that passed through is opening the door for temperatures to dive down just a bit. So here's a look at the forecast for the next few days. How we're looking at snow for the next couple of days into the weekend. 12 is all we're going to see on to in Tokyo on Saturday. And then we'll climb back up by Monday. Nagoya and Fukuoka also seeing temperatures in the mid-teens for the next few days. Here's a look at what's happening down into Australia. You notice is one, two big tropical cyclones, both of them severe because they're at or above Category 3 status. Now, Trevor is already making his way over the Gulf of Carpentaria and toward the northern coastline of Northern Territory. You are looking at the possibility of a Category 4 storm landing as you go into Saturday. So please make sure you're making the preparations now because we're talking about some very strong winds that are likely to pick up relatively soon as the storm moves its way to the west and south. Over into Western Australia, Veronica is a Category 4 storm looking at possibly intensifying to a Category 5 system, but uh, when it makes landfall, it may be weakening just a bit, but nevertheless, very strong winds associated with this so areas near Port Hedland westward. You need to be preparing for it. Some places in both locations could see up to 400 millimeters of rainfall accumulation over the next few days, so that will lead to flooding, so make those preparations now. Here's a look at what's happening across North America, down toward the south and west. We still have this little low-pressure system that continues to move toward the east and bringing the possibility of seeing some strong thunderstorms as we go through Friday. So be on the lookout for that. North and east, hey, we're still talking about winter weather. Yeah, talking about sleet, heavy snow, and freezing rain extending from portions of northern Virginia, West Virginia, all the way into the southern areas of Quebec as we go into Friday. So you want to be on the lookout for this because it's going to be around as we go through the day. That's a look at your forecast. Hope you have a good day wherever you are.
From April, NHK Newsline is getting a brand new look. Key stories from Japan and across the region. NHK Newsline Asia 24. Keeping on top of the world of business. Newsline Biz. Close-up stories on people and issues. Newsline In-Depth. And the latest world news on the hour. NHK Newsline. Watch us on NHK World Japan TV. Online or on our free app. So if you see a different looking studio and new programs on April 1st, it's not a joke. I'm James Tengon. Thanks for watching NHK Newsline. Choice of the day. Asia Insight. Dining with the chef. Cook around Japan, Fukushima. We explore new developments in Fukushima cuisine. Changing society through art. Message from Tamiji Kitagawa. Japan to the world, NHK World Japan. For this special episode of Imagination, we report on the latest Japanese pop culture trending in Shenzhen, China. How does J-pop influence Chinese pop culture? See what's happening in Shenzhen right now. Mountains over 4,000 meters high surround the country of Tajikistan in Central Asia. It's home to a population of 9 million, 90% of whom are Muslim. In the bitter cold of winter, celebratory music echoes through the streets. It's wedding season. Weddings are special to Tajiks. It's often said that they must be held even at the risk of bankruptcy. But over the last few years, marriage has been changing fast. The number of weddings has plummeted, while divorces have soared. One major cause is the laborers who travel to Russia and other countries to earn money. With few industries, Tajikistan is the poorest of all the former Soviet nations. 40% of the country's working age population leave their homeland. Many young men of marriageable age are in Moscow. 
برای ناچاری دختر مقبول ایتا Marrying someone suitable and enjoying a happy family life isn't easy. The entire family becomes part of the hunt for a bride. <laughs> Many migrant workers return in February. Discover how the labor market is disrupting marriage customs in Tajikistan. Nurek is a small town on the outskirts of the capital, Dushanbe. Twenty-three-year-old Maruf has just returned from two years working in Russia. He's on his way to escort his bride to their wedding. Lavish weddings are a Tajik tradition. They cost about 5,000 U.S. dollars. Maruf was working to save funds for the celebration. Anzurat, his bride, is four years younger than him. But they don't know each other very well. My daughter, they sign the certificate at the registry office. They are now formally married. They'll have a brief spell of newlywed life in a small room in his family home. Maruf wants to build a new house and support his wife and future children. To do that, he'll return to migrant work before the summer. He needs to earn money in Russia to do anything. His three brothers all work there as well. So do his friends. This is the plot where he'll build. The money he saved was all used to lay the foundations. Maruf worked at a construction site in Moscow. He has few good memories of the job. One major reason for the rise in Tajik migrant work
It even sponsored a musical tribute to such workers and hired popular singers for the record. This letter, Ochin Krasiyan. Uh, Marov will once again miss the arrival of greenery to his hometown. How much longer must he work abroad? Не уезжай, наверное, как говорит, да, она? Или она? Не ничего. Пока не. Не думай так. Пока не думай. Вы любите ее? Понемножку. Weddings are the perfect occasion to meet women. They provide an important opportunity to find a bride. Marifat is 43 and is looking for brides for two of her relatives. Marifat's nephew, Sukhrob, is 23 and has worked construction in Moscow for two years. The other is her 20-year-old second cousin, Khairidin. He went to Moscow six months ago, planning to work for a year. Marifat and her sister, Narzugul, make a video call to discuss potential brides. <laughs> The next day, the sisters begin their search. There are several ways to find a bride. The first is to visit friends and ask if parents are considering marriage for their daughters. Does anyone know of a suitable girl? <laughs> Hmm. 
اگر دختری که چاش کوته کی خوندگی خشوع اکس فیدا اگر نداری دکچه تو دارم دختری کلمات شرایط نیست. چی ندارم که خیلی شرایط ندارم. نمیتونه نه. نه نه نه. شکر نشیت خیلی کنن. نه نه زندگی چیه خیلی ندارم شرایط ندارم خیلی خیلی میکنم. مالی خیلی لازم نیست مالی. Finding a good match requires a lot of data, and both families must agree on the conditions. Only focusing on the positives won't work. After all, the bride's families will also do their research. Работает хорошо, не другим делам не занимается, чисто заработка получается, хорошо, хороший работник, про нее хороший парень говорят, поэтому оттуда тоже да не возьмут, потом здесь будут сватываться. Марифат сестер Нарзугул visits a medical university in the capital Dushanbe. to look for a bride. Doctors don't earn much, but have stable work even after marriage. It's a major plus when looking for a wife. Narzugul talks to students directly to find potential candidates. If they find a suitable girl, they'll speak to her teacher and make further inquiries. In the end, Narzugul returns home with no candidate. Ну иногда два года. Ну как попадет? Иногда на глаз попадет такого, как кого как получается. Иногда два года даже ищем. Долго, долго, трудно. Очень трудно. Marifat is searching for brides for her nephew and cousin, but secretly feels conflicted. She understands how the bride's family feels. У нас одна пословица есть, таджикский старый не пословица. Девочка в сорок дней мама уже думает о ее это. Her oldest daughter is nineteen and is preparing for marriage. A bride in Tajikistan should have dozens of cushions prepared for her wedding. Made by hand, her hope chest will be prepared by all the women in the family before any engagement is in place. Marifat says she receives constant marriage requests for her daughter. 
Вот каждый просят прийти к вам, не прийти к вам, а я говорю, нет, пока, ну, как я смотрю с той стороны, я сразу говорю, нет, не, может, другой найдете, может, это, как вот мы ходили, вот они, вот так. Марифат has one unshakable condition. Не образованный в России уйдет два месяца здесь, десять месяц там, я не буду за таких. У нас обычно все такие. Вот придут, жениться, три месяца побудет, девять месяцев в России. All the men in her extended family have worked in Russia. Marifat has seen firsthand the pain and anguish suffered by the women left behind. Все равно же без любви, без взаимопонимания, без желаний трудно жить, тяжело. Потом найдет себе раз и бросит, чтобы вместе, если был бы здесь хорошая работа, хорошая зарплата, чтобы все они здесь на своем родине работали, содержали семью, чтобы вся семья была счастлива, долго жили вместе, увиделись, как дети растут, как жена болеет, не болеет, в горе и счастье, чтобы вместе. Их брак без регистрации, они не, не могут ничего делать и при, не могут претендовать на какое-либо право. И поэтому было бы хорошо, если бы все браки были с регистрацией. Потому что когда брак с, с регистрацией, и этот брак разорнутым станет, все равно женщина имеет право, имеет право на алименты, имеет право на жизнь чтобы претендовать на жилье и на другие права, которые дана мужем, мужа и жене. For wives abandoned by their husbands, life is extremely hard. 35-year-old Dilorom has two children. Her husband works in Russia and divorced her five years ago to marry a Russian woman. They had been married for 13 years, but since it was an Islamic marriage, Dilorom receives no support. Today, she lives in a room in her parents' house. She works every day from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. in a cake factory. The pay is low, but there are few jobs for women, so Dilorom has little choice. Я хотела им детям отдать, как у меня старший ну, заплакал, заревел, что не хочет он, хочет быть со мной. И вот работает.
Marifat is still looking for brides for her male relatives. She's found someone for her nephew, Sukhrob. Marifat and her sister have spoken to the girl's mother several times, and she's promised to seriously consider an engagement. Today they're visiting again to get a final answer. The sisters have a plan to ensure a positive outcome. Their oldest sister, Latofat, is 66. Walking is hard for her, so she rarely goes out. But she makes the effort for her nephew. This is the potential bride's mother. Her daughter is in high school and hopes to study medicine. She's not sure whether to encourage the marriage. The mother listens carefully before responding. The engagement is accepted, and Marifat's long search is finally over. That night, she reports back to her nephew in Moscow. Late February. The airport is busy with men who've enjoyed a brief respite in their homeland. They leave Tajikistan once again in a bid to secure a better future and a better life for their families. NHK World Japan brings the latest information on Japan to the world.
for 24-7 access, check out the smartphone and tablet app. Featuring news, live streaming, and video on demand. Also including push notifications of earthquake and tsunami warnings in English. Check it out. It's 8 p.m. in Japan. Welcome to Newsroom Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Here are the headlines. Japanese baseball legend Ichiro Suzuki announces his retirement after a stellar 27-year professional career. The leaders have agreed to postpone the date for Brexit, but they've also imposed new, two new deadlines. U.S. President Donald Trump says it's time for America to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. North Korea withdraws its staff from a liaison office set up to promote bilateral exchanges with the South. On today's People and Places, an artist offers a glimpse of how social recluses live and gives them a chance to reconnect with society. We start with international baseball star Ichiro Suzuki, who's ending the long career that made him one of the greatest players in history. And he chose to hang up his cleats in the country where he started it all. Japan. Ichiro joined the Seattle Mariners in Tokyo for its season opener and his last major league appearance. When he left the field, he got a standing ovation from the entire stadium, including past and present teammates such as Ken Griffey Jr. I had nine great years in Japan. I had just started my 19th season in the U.S. But I decided now is the time to tip my hat for the final time. In spring training, I couldn't get the kind of results I was after, and I couldn't get back to the level where I need to be. I wanted to get in one more hit for my fans in this game, but it didn't work out that way. Ichiro started his career in 1992 in the Japanese Professional League. In 2001, he joined Major League Baseball with the Seattle Mariners. In his first season, he racked up 242 hits, helping him win MVP and Rookie of the Year. He went on to become the first player to get at least 200 hits in 10 consecutive seasons. Baseball fans around the world are reacting to the news. I'm shocked, feeling a sense of loss. I'm afraid I can't work tomorrow. He's, he's a very respectable, very like strong player that has been around and been, been under the Seattle Mariners' name for a long time. I think they'll miss him. Ichiro was like the first like person I ever really like got interested in with baseball. He's like always someone I looked up to. Ichiro became a baseball legend on both sides of the Pacific, but he recalls that success didn't come overnight. In the beginning, American fans were harsh. When I was training in 2001, they would tell me to go back to Japan. But after they started to acknowledge my achievements, I felt closer to them, and we have been close ever since. 
関係が出来上がる。Masahiro Tanaka, an ace pitcher for the New York Yankees, says the popularity Ichiro enjoyed in the U.S. is unparalleled. When he was called in for the last time, what happened there seemed to be uniquely American. It was quite a send off. The crowd, their opponents, everybody applauded. It was a special atmosphere that doesn't happen to just anyone. I think it shows how much respect Ichiro has earned. Two way sensation Shohei Otani from the Los Angeles Angels says he always aspired to be like Ichiro. He's my role model. He always will be. I can't watch him play anymore, but he's always been my idol and will remain an inspiration. The Baseball Hall of Fame Museum says the name Ichiro Suzuki could be added to the list of the greatest players of all time five years after his retirement in 2025. 外国人になったことで、Living in America as a foreigner made me discover a new side of myself. I became more considerate of others. I tried to imagine the suffering that other people go through. I think this experience will be a great help to me in the future. Ichiro flew back to Seattle from Narita Airport this afternoon. The airline allowed him to board from gate 51, the same number on the back of his uniform. And now to business with Yuko Fukushima. So, Yuko, the EU has agreed to delay the Brexit date. So, that means Theresa May has won some. Breathing room? Yes, just some breathing room.、Uh, because the ball is back into the UK's Parliament's court, and another crucial vote is just days away. That's because, while the European Union agreed to extend the UK's exit from the bloc, it also set conditions. Brexit was supposed to happen on March 29th, but on Thursday, Prime Minister May reached an agreement with EU leaders to push that date back to May 22nd if she gets her withdrawal deal approved by Parliament next week. If she fails, the deadline will be April 12th. Until that date, all options will remain open and the cliff edge date will be delayed. The UK government will still have a choice of a deal. No deal, a long extension, or revoking Article 50. May welcome the EU decision. We are now at the moment of decision, and I will make every effort to ensure that we are able to leave with a deal. If the Prime Minister cannot obtain parliamentary approval by April 12th, she has to present the UK's plan by that date. That would include a decision on whether it will take part in the bloc's parliamentary elections set for late May. Analysts say a failure to meet that deadline could result in a no deal Brexit. China says its trade negotiators, with,、uh, negotiators will resume talks with U.S. officials next week. The two day talks, well, talks will be the first high level meeting since the U.S. postponed a March 1st deadline for hiking tariffs on Chinese goods. The talks start on Thursday in Beijing. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin will sit down with Chinese Vice Premier Liu He. He will follow up with a visit to Washington in early April for more talks. The negotiators still have a wide gap to close. The U.S. is demanding China reviews its preferential treatment of state owned companies. China, meanwhile, wants the U.S. to remove punitive tariffs on its products. But U.S. President Donald Trump has warned he may keep the higher levies for a substantial period to ensure that China upholds the deal. The tariff war complicates China's efforts to revive a slowing economy. 
and for Tencent, one of the country's largest companies, dealing with another complication is the last thing it needs. China's internet powerhouse just posted annual results and they paint a mixed picture. Revenue rose 30 percent in yuan terms to more than $45 billion. But net profits showed the weakest growth in a decade, 10 percent. On the plus side, revenue from online advertising surged more than 40 percent thanks to more traffic on WeChat, the social networking platform owned by Tencent. But that was offset by a tough year for the company's key gaming business. Revenue dropped 8 percent after the government suspended approvals of new games. Officials began lifting those restrictions in December. The concern now is how the trade conflict with the United States will affect consumer spending. Tencent executives are hoping they can turbocharge profits with the new 5G platform for their Internet business. Now, turning to old-fashioned brick-and-mortar retailers, Japanese convenience stores are testing a radical change to their business model, and it looks like some customers will need time to adjust. Japan is suffering a severe labor shortage. As a result, some store operators are thinking of shrinking their business hours. 7-Eleven Japan has started a trial at 10 of its stores. One in Tokyo is now opening its doors at 5 a.m. and closing at 1 a.m. 7-Eleven officials say the trial will continue for at least several months. They want to see how the shorter hours affect store performance and also see how customers respond. Our immediate survey got a mixed reaction. I just wanted to buy cup noodles. I'm sorry I couldn't. I expected convenience stores to be open 24 hours a day. 24-7 business means workers must work late hours. But really, it would be nice if they could get more time off. 7-Eleven officials say they're trying out three different opening and closing times. Other chain operators are working on similar trials of their own. Well, investors are buying up Japanese government bonds after the U.S. central bank forecast slower growth in the world's leading economy. The interest rate on the 10-year benchmark bond has fallen to its lowest level in more than two years. The yield on the benchmark closed at minus 0.08 percent on Friday. The U.S. Federal Reserve signaled it would not be raising interest rates this year because of a slowing economy. Market sources say the Fed's announcement led U.S. long-term interest rates to fall as investors became cautious about the country's economic outlook. They say this is putting downward pressure on Japan's benchmark long-term interest rate. Bond yields typically fall when prices rise. And now to the markets. In Tokyo, the Nikkei was up about a tenth of a percent, ending at 21,627. The Federal Reserve's cautious outlook on the U.S. economy had investors worry about taking on risk. But chip-related shares supported the index, tracking gains by their counterparts on Wall Street overnight. And the rest of the region looked like this. In China, the Shanghai Composite also added about a 0.1 percent on hopes of more policy measures to spur growth in the world's second biggest economy. Lingering uncertainty over trade talks between Beijing and Washington limited the gains. And that's the biz for this week. Turning now to the Middle East, U.S. President Donald Trump has announced a dramatic policy shift. He says it's time for the United States to fully recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Trump made the comment Thursday on Twitter, saying the area has strategic and security importance to the state of Israel and regional stability. Israel seized the Golan Heights from Syria during the Six-Day War in 1967, but sovereignty of the region is disputed. The plan was welcomed by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is campaigning for re-election. But the proposal has prompted criticism. An Arab League official said the announcement was beyond international law, and experts say it could complicate the Middle East peace process. This is just the latest in a series of controversial moves in the region by Trump. Last year, he moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. That outraged Palestinians who see East Jerusalem as the capital of their future state. South Korea's Unification Ministry says North Korea has pulled staff out of a liaison office jointly set up last year for bilateral exchanges. 
The South Korean government regrets North Korea's decision to withdraw, but remains hopeful the country will return in the near future and run the joint liaison office properly, as outlined in the agreement between the North and the South. Pyongyang's move may be an attempt to get Seoul to play a more active role in matters concerning the two Koreas and the United States. An article posted Friday on a North Korean website was critical of the South. It said peace on the peninsula should be brought about by the two countries, not by a third party. The article accuses South Korean authorities of failing to take practical steps that would fundamentally improve North-South relations. It calls on Seoul to make demands on Washington. After the second U.S.-North Korea summit ended without an agreement, South Korea said it would mediate between Pyongyang and Washington. The South also said it would provide assistance to the North within the framework of the international sanctions against Pyongyang. We move now to special coverage of Thailand's general election. This Sunday's vote will be the first since the military took over in a 2014 coup. In this third and final day of our series, we'll focus on the military-led government's handling of the economy over the past five years. Let's go to NHK World's Warawita Yemsuda, who is at a campaign rally for a pro-military party. Warawita, tell us about the rally. It's the final push for the Bang Charat party before the election, and it's taking place in downtown Bangkok. The party wants the interim Prime Minister Prayutsa Nosha to stay in power in a new government after the election. The retired general is expected to appear on stage later in the rally. Thousands of supporters are here to listen to his last dumb speech, and I spoke to some of them. I go to vote whenever I have a chance. I feel like people are very enthusiastic this time. Only Prayut. If we need stability, Prayut must remain in power. Party executives here are trying to drive home the point that the military-led government brought stability instead of political conflict, and they keep pointing to steady economy growth. But Thais, especially those in rural areas, are concerned about the gap between rich and poor. Take a look. Several makeup projects are underway in Thailand. They include creating special economic zones in the country's east. In the five years of the interim prime minister's reign, Thailand's economy has gone from strength to strength. Growth has been climbing since Prayut Chan Osha took power. This year, it's expected to be around 4%. The government has built infrastructure such as roads and digital platforms to create opportunities for the people. One project the government is pushing forward is a high-speed railway connecting Thailand and southern China. Construction was long delayed due to tight restrictions on foreign engineers. But the prime minister relaxed the rules to let Chinese engineers work on the project. But while the economy is buoyant, the gap between rich and poor is growing. In a recent Credit Suisse survey of 40 countries, Thailand's wealth disparity was the widest. The report indicates 1% of Thailand's population owns 67% of the nation's wealth. And some 21 million temporary employees work on farms and in factories for low pay. Farmers will never prosper. We'll just go on like this. It's the government's fault that we can't get out of poverty. Han Sak Benjasi Pitak lives in the northern city of Chiang Mai. He supported former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, who now lives in self imposed exile. Han Sak has been critical of the government, pointing out that many people in rural areas live in poverty. After the military coup, he was detained several times in a military facility. They confined me to make sure I didn't do anything. Then young soldiers took turns to watch over me. 
Pan Sak says army officers visited his home several times a week after he was released. After the ban on political activities was lifted, when the election campaign started, Han Sak attended a gathering of Thaksin supporters. He says he wants to get back the freedom he once had. I hope to see the day when Thai people acquire full democracy, having rights and being able to act according to one's convictions. Even if Prayut succeeds in holding on to power, the question remains of whether he can spread the economic benefit more fairly in the country. Hmm. Baroita, your story talked about the wealth gap. Has the pro-military party made any promises to narrow it? Yes, the Palang Prasarat party has announced several measures targeting low-income earners. This includes universal health care and a minimum wage hike, as well as agricultural subsidies. This is seen as an effort to take votes away from parties loyal to former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, whose support base is mainly made up of poor farmers in the country's north and northeast. But all the rival parties, including the pro Thaksin camp, are pledging populist policies of their own. So it's hard to predict whether the promises will attract new voters to the pro military party. So, what are we tell the vote is this coming Sunday. What can you tell us about the latest situation? Analysts predict that no single party will win the majority in the 500-member lower house. They expect pro-Taksin parties to win the most, around 180 seats. The pro-military party is forecast to secure about 100. But in the upper house, all 250 seats are effectively handpicked by the military. And the election of the next prime minister is through a vote of members from both houses. That means the pro-military camp still has a big advantage when it comes to selecting the next prime minister. So it's looking like coalition negotiations will be the key after the election. We could see a situation where a third party will have a deciding vote. Analysts are keeping a close eye on the anti-Taksin Democrat Party, which is favored by middle and upper classes, mainly in urban areas. But no matter what happens, the military's influence over the new government will remain. And how that will work with the country's path back to democracy remains to be seen. Thank you, Warabita. Okinawa has launched another lawsuit to challenge the central government's plans to relocate a U.S. base within the southern Japanese prefecture. But the country's defense minister says it's important that ongoing relocation work doesn't stop. If the issue of relocating the Fatenma air station gets stuck again, that could lead to the base staying where it is permanently. We absolutely need to avoid that situation. Land reclamation is currently underway in the Henoko district, and the defense minister says work will proceed as scheduled. Both the U.S. and Japanese governments want to relocate the U.S. Marine Corps Futema Air Station there. They say the move is needed because the current base is situated in a densely populated area. But the Okinawa government opposes the plan. It wants the base moved out of the prefecture altogether. In its latest back and forth with Tokyo, Okinawa will try to get an injunction revoked. The order was issued last October and gave the green light for work to proceed. Earlier this week, Okinawa's governor called on the prime minister to temporarily stop the work to have talks. That request was rejected. It followed last month's non-binding referendum when 70 percent of voters in Okinawa opposed the reclamation project. Japan's Foreign Minister Taro Kono has been forced to pull out of his official duties after falling ill with kidney problems. Ministry officials say he's due to undergo further tests. Kono developed the fever on Wednesday and postponed a scheduled diet committee meeting the same day. He was diagnosed with pyelonephritis on Thursday. The condition is linked to a bacterial infection of the kidneys. One of Kono's deputies will stand in for him while he recovers. Foreigners are flocking to Japan to meet a labor shortage in the country. For them and their families, learning Japanese is essential for getting by in daily life. Our next report looks at how a city near Tokyo is trying to meet this need. 36,000 Kawaguchi residents began their lives in other countries. 
That number has increased by 16,000 over the past decade and now represents 6% of the population. Liu Jun came to Japan from China five years ago because of her husband's work. She has an urgent reason to learn Japanese. She's pregnant and needs to understand what her doctor is telling her. She's also unclear about how much childbirth will cost. When I go to government offices or hospitals, I don't understand what I'm being told. June has enrolled in a night school run by volunteers. It's a start, but she's looking for even more. She'll need all the language and cultural insights she can get in order to raise a child in Japan. I want to find somewhere where I can study. Kawaguchi is offering Japanese classes for people like her in a public night school, opening in April. We'll offer support to help them get their Japanese language skills up to par. Classes will run for four hours on weekdays. The intensive schedule may be the reason only about 40 people applied for the course. The city expected 200. Some people probably want to come but can't get away from work or family responsibilities. We want to provide education that's in line with their needs. Although the enrollment is a disappointment, the program is just beginning. The city is committed to making itself a place where everyone can fit in. This is how people who've cut themselves off from society live. These photos of messy, cluttered rooms offer an insight into people known as hikikomori, social recluses. It's estimated there are more than one million of them in Japan. Most hikikomori are in their 20s and 30s. A man who once was a social recluse himself is now giving them a chance to reconnect with society through a unique art project. The faces of some interviewees are not shown for reasons of privacy. The project includes a photo book and this exhibition held in Yokohama in February. Visitors looked through cracks in the gallery's walls at photos that recluses took of their rooms. The idea was to give the public a glimpse into how hikikomori live. This room contains hundreds of technical books. The person who took these images became a recluse after attending university for 10 years and failing to find work as a researcher. This room is packed with garbage. The display has a message from the woman who took the photo. It says she feels safe living surrounded by garbage because it feels like punishment for being who she is. These photos and the accompanying text give hikikomori a chance to share the feelings they've bottled up inside. Artist Atsushi Watanabe planned the photo book and exhibition. He started this project five years ago. He wanted to encourage recluses to document their rooms. About 40 people sent photos. We don't hear the voices of social recluses, so I wanted to listen to them and create an opportunity for them to speak. Watanabe has first-hand experience of being a hikikomori. He couldn't go outside after graduating from university. He was worried about his artistic career. Three years passed, Watanabe reconnected with society thanks to art. He realized that photos he'd taken of his room offered insights into the hikikomori lifestyle. The time spent in isolation was in fact spent creating the art piece. By shifting the mindset, the time can be viewed as creative. 
Watanabe's call for recluses to share photos of their rooms has changed at least one person's life. This woman in her 30s had been living as a hikikomori for more than 10 years. This is a photo of her room. Books, CDs, magazines, all kinds of stuff surround her Japanese style bedding, which she never puts away. I used to spend almost all day lying in bed. My friends are working, and some have even gotten married and have children. I didn't know what to do and just became very anxious. The woman saw Watanabe's request on Twitter and sent him a photo. Watanabe said it was a beautiful piece that conveys the sense of her struggles and concerns. I'm glad I took action. I feel I'm involved in a project and in making something together. The woman says communicating with Watanabe and having her photo selected for the exhibition has boosted her confidence. She's now able to leave her home more often. The exhibition includes other artworks aimed at supporting hikikomori and making the public aware of this social issue. One of the people involved in the project is this man in his 30s. He has avoided other people for more than 10 years after he was bullied in junior high school. Watanabe made a copy of the men's junior high school graduation album in concrete. He's done that so the man can make a symbolic break with his painful childhood memories. One more time. I... Wow, feels great. The man and Watanabe rearrange the broken pieces. It felt like I was fighting against my memories and anger from junior high. Almost like I was fighting the true reason for my scars. The artwork is complete. The bits of concrete have been stuck together using the kintsugi technique where gold fills the cracks. The broken shards of the past have been put together to become art. I really like the concept of being damaged but still standing firm. It's like myself. What am I going to do with this piece? Will it come together again? I don't know. This will be very important for my life. The idea is meeting them face to face, talking with them and creating something together. A painful past experience has potential for the future. Watanabe hopes his project will open a crack in the wall of isolation and help Hikikomori regain the confidence to reconnect with the world outside. Daichi Takahashi, NHK World. It may be a marriage of convenience, but the results look promising. Agricultural researchers in Kochi Prefecture, Western Japan, are feeding their prized Wagyu beef cattle with another local specialty, a citrus fruit called yuzu. NHK World's Ayaka Otaka has the story. The Tosa Akaushi Wagyu is lean and tender. The beef was served at a recent testing event. The mouth bordering steaks are from cattle fed with yuzu. They won high marks from connoisseurs. I'm touched. It's so delicious. I hope it becomes a leading brand of beef from Kochi. The citrus field was developed by a group led by Associate Professor Kazutsugu Matsukawa at Kochi University. They were alarmed by the situation facing the Tosa Akaushi breed. Over the past 10 years, the number of farmers has fallen by half, and the cattle population has also dropped. Professor Matsukawa thought 
that if farmers could earn more, they would remain on the job and the breed might be saved. The researchers turn their attention to yuzu. Kochi is Japan's largest producer of the fruit, with 12,000 tons per year. Once the juice is squeezed out, the pips and pears are thrown away, more than 5,000 tons per year. The researchers focused on the vitamin-rich leftovers to develop a feed paste. We gave it away because it was going to be discarded. But it's wonderful if the pills can be put to good use. The group spent a year finding the best mixture of yuzu, dried grass and corn powder. It then tested the feed on cattle for one month. The results looked good. The cows showed improved liver and kidney function. The cattle steadily gained weight while remaining healthy. The experiment was a success. After repeated tests, Professor Matsukawa felt assured that the healthy feed would add value to the Akaushi beef brand. He also found that the cattle's fat contained more of a substance called oleic acid. It helps melt the fat at lower temperatures, giving the meat a melting texture in the mouth. The chefs who cooked the meat also gave it a thumbs up. The outlook is bright. Demand for yuzu-fed beef is likely to grow. The beef won praise, and that boosted our confidence. We hope to team up with many others with a shared goal of marketing the beef as a premium brand. The question now is whether the citrus-fed wagyu packs enough sizzle for a market that values fatty, marbled meat. Ayaka Otaka, NHK World, Kochi. It's time for Weather Around Asia with our meteorologist, Jonathan Oh. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. So today was such a lovely warm mm -hmm. day. I mean, why would you bring a coat, you know? Why would you bring a coat? <laughs> Well, you wouldn't want to wear it on your way here, but if you're going home, it may be just a little bit cooler. The sun has, you know, gone down, and so that's when you probably need that coat. I know, I should have brought one. Yes, <laughs> she should have brought her coat. Because we are expecting temperatures to drop just a bit as we go throughout the evening hours, uh, but we are expecting temperatures to also follow that trend for the weekend, cooler weather for Saturday and Sunday. There's a reason for that. You see this little blue line that we throw on the screen every once in a while? We call this a cold front, and behind it is cold air. And we've got plenty of it coming into Japan. So we're going from temperatures that are more like late April to temperatures more like late February. It's, you know, we're going back and forth now that we are going through the month of March. So be prepared for that cooler air to be in place and maybe dealing with some clouds. Snow possibly up toward the north here. Looking at snow for Sapporo Saturday and Sunday. 12 for the high in Tokyo, 15 uh, by Sunday, then 18 by Monday. So we will warm back up as we go into the first part of next week. Let's take a look at what's happening in Australia. We have two major storms to talk about. Take a look at this video, first coming out of Northern Territory, where about 2,000 people had to be evacuated. Uh, the reason why is because there are a lot of areas that are likely to be impacted by this approaching storm. So residents in both Northern Territory and Queensland had to get out of the way, and so they are definitely making those preparations, and those who are in place need to be getting ready as those, that storm comes into the picture. Quick look at the map right now shows us the storm is expected to continue to move as a Category 3 to a Category 4 storm and then make landfall during the day on Saturday. This is why you have to meet, be ready for this as we're talking about some significant rainfall and strong winds. Same thing with Veronica over in Western Australia from Port Hedland points westward. Some places may be dealing with close to 400 millimeters of rainfall. So flooding concerns will be in place. Make sure you're preparing for these storms as they come on shore. And please be safe. That's a look at your forecast. Hope you have a wonderful weekend wherever you are.
And once again, the headlines. Japanese baseball legend Ichiro Suzuki announces his retirement after a stellar 27-year professional career. EU leaders have agreed to postpone the date for Brexit, but they've also imposed two new deadlines. U.S. President Donald Trump says it's time for America to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. North Korea withdraws its staff from a liaison office set up to promote bilateral exchanges with the South. And that's it for today's Yusuf Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Coming up next in HQ World's interview program, Direct Talk. Stay with us. Welcome to Direct Talk. Africa rising is a common term used for the continent's fast economic growth. The United Nations predicts that in 2019, African economies will grow by an average of 3.7%. Mo Ibrahim is a Sudanese-British billionaire considered to be one of the continent's most successful entrepreneurs. In 2005, he sold his mobile phone company, Celtel, for more than $3 billion. He used the money to set up the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, which promotes good governance and democracy. He wants to correct the image that most people have of African countries. You ask people what they think of, of Africa, and the first thing they'll say, uh, uh, malnutrition, babies, uh, sick mothers, uh, refugee camps. The, the view is very skewed, and uh, I, 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 I used to blame all these charitable organizations, they flood our TV screens with images of sick people, poor people, starving people, because they want to raise money for the foundation. And the aid, which is great, we understand that. But somehow people think of us as, as uh, really uh, uh, all those victims and, 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 and starving. We have the best athletes, we, we run faster than anybody, we jump higher than anybody, we dance better than anybody. We're very healthy. There will not be football in Europe without African players. We, we, we hope be able to start to think of Africa as just a normal, like everybody else. We're a normal, normal people and normal continent. There's much to celebrate about the progress that Africa has made. Its growth rate is now higher than the global average. However, the image of Africa that we are all familiar with does reflect a reality. It's estimated that half of Africa's population lives in poverty, with limited access to basic human needs, such as nutrition, clean water and shelter. For Ibrahim, some of the blame lies with Africa's politicians. Why are we poor? I think we are poor because we mismanaged our resources uh, and our human resources, also not only natural resources. That's why we need decent leadership and we need good governance in Africa. That is the way forward. We have to appreciate that countries and continents doesn't change overnight. There is no silver bullet. It's a process. It's going to take years, but it will happen. And. Uh, the young generation, young people are coming, they are better than our generation and they're more educated and those people have to change the way we're doing things in Africa. Mo Ibrahim is one of Africa's richest men. Forbes estimates his personal wealth at $1.8 billion. Because of his success in business, he's become a respected voice in Africa, regularly meeting with politicians and business leaders and using his influence to make the case for more effective governance and political leadership. Ibrahim is a self-made man born in northern Sudan and brought up in the Egyptian port city of Alexandria. I had a very ordinary life. Uh, I come from a middle class, actually lower middle class families. You know, I grew up in a loving family. I had a happy childhood and uh, I was interested in science and engineering, and uh, uh, I never thought uh, of being a businessman, strange enough. 
Mo Ibrahim studied engineering at university and then joined the telecoms industry. In the 1990s, he was based in the UK, where he worked for British Telecom. It was the early days of the mobile phone, and the technology fascinated him. In 1998, he founded a mobile phone company, Celtel, with the goal of building a network across Africa. Celtel was a tough proposition because the company uh, needed, really needed intensive capital infusion because we were growing at 100% rate every year. Growth was explosive. So we need to just to keep building infrastructure. Banks refuse to give us any funding. Any telecom company in the world is usually funded by 50, 60 percent, you know, banks and loans, etc., bonds, whatever. Nobody will do that for Africa, at least at that time. Uh, we're the only telecom company which was financed completely by equity. But it was very successful. Uh, successful as a business, it was extremely profitable, but also successful as a social enterprise. It changed life in Africa beyond anything else. And that was really amazing. The speed of change was dramatic. When Ibrahim set up Celtel, there were just three million Africans with mobile phones. Today, there are a billion. The mobile phone suddenly became accessible for Africans because they could buy phone credit through prepaid scratch cards rather than through monthly contracts. Selling scratch cards also created opportunities for budding entrepreneurs. We only have prepaid customers because the weakness of the banking system. Not everybody have a credit card or so we use prepaid everywhere. And this means every morning, so many millions of people have to go out and buy scratch cards. We're creating so many jobs, so all entrepreneurs. We had like 400,000 of them. Every one of them have like a little kiosk to sell this scratch card. In a few weeks, then Boxes of oranges will appear, and some bananas, and then some coke, and some, uh, and then is a shop. And suddenly you have 400,000 business people, all started by mobile phones. So it was an enabler for a lot of cottage industries, a lot of other entrepreneurs. It connected people. It changes the social life. Celtel was a great success and became one of Africa's biggest mobile phone operators, with 24 million subscribers across 14 countries. In 2005, Ibrahim sold Celtel for $3.4 billion, and the company was renamed Airtel. Beginning a new chapter, he used the money to set up the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. We need to raise the profile of African leaders, especially those people who are really doing wonderful things for, for their people. The main focus of the foundation has been on improving leadership and governance in Africa. Because African countries feature prominently in global league tables for corruption, tackling this issue is key. We need to end corruption. We need to have a more transparent uh, 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 societies. Uh, governments are there to serve people. A leader is there to serve. Uh, it's not the other way around. Uh, so I think that's what is, needs to be done by Africa. And this can only be done by Africans. Nobody come from outside and, and talk. It. So I said, OK, I'm an African, and I made this money in Africa. I don't need it, frankly. Uh, I better use the African money to do this stuff. And nobody in Africa can tell me, hey, it's not your business. So it's false to me to, I have to do this. Uh, so that's what, I, what I'm trying to do. One of the main activities of the foundation is its annual award. It recognizes an African political leader who's handed over power to a democratically elected successor. The most recent winner was Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, 
former president of Liberia. It is my hope that women and girls across Africa will be inspired to break through barriers. Johnson Sirleaf held Liberia together despite the impact of civil war and Ebola and improved the lives of ordinary people. The foundation believes its work is making a difference to individual countries and to the continent as a whole. We started to move the needle, but we understand from the outset is changing a country or let alone changing a continent. It is a long term process and there are going to be setbacks every now and then, but the job has to be done. And we understand from the outset is a long term issue. It takes 10, 20, 30 years, but we need to do it. A lot of other people are joining us in what they're trying to do. One of the most controversial issues for Africa is China's growing influence as America pulls back. Chinese investment in African infrastructure has grown rapidly, reaching an estimated $3 billion per year. Ibrahim would like to see China use its influence to promote better governance in Africa. From Africans' point of view, it is wonderful that we have more partners. Europe is the largest partner of Africa. Uh, China now is coming close to that. America now moved back to a very distant third uh, in our relationship. So China changed the dynamics in, of trade and business in Africa, there's no question about that. For that, we are grateful. The more uh, partners we have, it's better for whatever I have to sell or to buy. Uh, but China needs to start where, from where the Europeans ended. We cannot have good governance in public life without good governance in business. So that is a flag to our Chinese friends. It's wonderful China is having their campaign against corruption in China. But that should also include what you're doing in Africa. China has invested heavily in Sudan, Ibrahim's country of birth, which for years has been beset by political instability. President Omar al-Bashir has been charged with war crimes by the International Criminal Court over the conflict in Darfur. In 2018, street battles between protesters and armed forces resulted in dozens of deaths. The protests continue. And Ibrahim cannot hide his anger at the fact that this regime is still in power. The problem now we have is that we have the people completely rejecting the regime. 70% of our budget is secret. It's called the palace budget. 70%. And this is the president, security forces, army, police, militias, uh, uh, money to buy uh, loyalty, and uh, money to siphon into your pockets, whatever. Education have less than 2%, health is much less. So what do you expect? And, and, and uh, the business environment is, 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 is absolutely hostile. Uh, you cannot do business then. So the economy has been deteriorating over the years. Uh, people find it very difficult to live. It is a tough situation, but it is finished. I mean, this regime cannot continue. It lost all legitimacy. And it's just what we hope that they understand that anybody involved in a bloodbath or killing more people, those guys will face consequences. And uh, what saddens me is that the international community is just almost silent. For Ibrahim, events in Sudan reinforce his view of what Africa's priorities must be for the future. Leadership, governance, and the increasing threat posed by climate change. I'm, I'm just uh, outraged about how 
people are denying that there is an issue with climate. And the problem with that is going to be too late if we reach a tipping point and we ended up putting up more carbon last year than ever. Next year, I think we're going to put even more carbon. So what are you doing? We are really being very stupid. We have a real uh, uh, deficit in leadership, unfortunately. Uh, then governance. Governance is essential. Uh, not only in public governance, also governance in, 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 in a private company. Difficult times for all of us. Today, we fly to Yonaguni-jima, the westernmost island in Japan. It has an area of 30 square kilometers and a population of 1,700. One man who knows the island inside and out is Ryuzo Shinomiya, a freediver. まあ、フリーダイビングっていうスポーツは、ま、いわゆる素潜りのスポーツで、とても フリーダイビングを例えば水面が25度ぐらいだとしたら深く潜っても25度ぐらいというふうにそういった意味で陸上で溶岩をして準備を行って、そのまま水中へ入って、同じその陸上と水中で精神状態で潜れるんじゃないかなと思ってますけ
そういったものに何かこう通ずるところがあるんじゃないかなと思うんですねやはり自分の心次第でそのパフォーマンスがガラッと変わってきますのですごく精神性の高いスポーツだなと思っています。It's a Friday night here in Japan. I'm James Tengan in Tokyo. This is NHK Newsline. We begin on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's unification ministry says North Korea has pulled out of a joint liaison office. It says Pyongyang has ordered all staff to leave. The facility opened last September and was a sign of improving ties between the countries. The South Korean government regrets North Korea's decision to withdraw, but remains hopeful the country will return in the near future and run the joint liaison office properly, as outlined in the agreement between the North and the South. Pyongyang's move may be an attempt to get the South to play a more active role in matters concerning the two Koreas and the U.S. An article posted Friday on a North Korean website was critical of the South, saying peace on the peninsula should be brought about by the two countries, not by a third party. The article accused South Korean authorities of failing to take practical steps that would fundamentally improve North-South relations. It called on Seoul to make demands on the U.S. After the second U.S.-North Korea summit ended without an agreement, South Korea said it would mediate between Pyongyang and Washington. The South also said it would provide assistance to the North within the framework of the international sanctions against Pyongyang. Meanwhile, the U.S. government has imposed sanctions on two Chinese shipping companies for violating U.N. Security Council sanctions resolutions on North Korea. It's the first such move since last month's Hanoi summit. The Treasury Department says one of the companies provided goods to a North Korean firm that's affiliated with Pyongyang's spy agency. It said the other enabled North Korean officials in Europe to purchase goods. The sanctions prohibit U.S. dealings with the designated companies and freezes their U.S. assets. The department also released a list of 67 vessels that it says engaged in illicit ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers or exported North Korean coal. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin reiterated that the full implementation of U.N. resolutions is crucial to achieving the full denuclearization of North Korea. Last month, Trump and Kim left Hanoi without a deal on the issue. Since then, Pyongyang has said there's no justification for maintaining full sanctions and that it may suspend negotiations with the U.S. But Washington has urged North Korea to continue talks. Staying with North Korea, state-run media say the country's National Assembly will meet on April 11th in Pyongyang. The Supreme People's Assembly decides the national budget law revisions, and personnel appointments. Earlier this month, 687 deputies were elected in the so-called vote. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was not on the ballot, and no explanation was given why. But there is growing speculation that he might be appointed to a new post. The new parliamentary session is expected to focus on rebuilding the economy as it continues to cope with a wide range of international sanctions. Meanwhile, sources say a top aide to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has been in Moscow since Tuesday. Kim chang son who is known as Kim Jong-un's butler, also visited Singapore and Vietnam ahead of the U.S.-North Korea summits. Russian President Vladimir Putin has previously invited the North Korean leader to visit Russia. So observers say the top aide's trip could indicate an upcoming summit between the two leaders. Nobel Peace Prize laureate and women's rights activist Malala Yousafzai is visiting Japan for the first time. She'll attend an international conference here in Tokyo. Malala met on Friday with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. She told him she's convinced that Japan can promote women's empowerment and education across the world. 
Unfortunately, 130 million girls are out of school today. Millions more are unprepared for the modern workforce. And to solve this problem, we need the support of individuals, businesses and governments. Malala will deliver a speech on Saturday at the two-day World Assembly for Women, an event sponsored by the Japanese government. She plans to speak about the importance of education and hold discussions with other female leaders. Among them will be UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. Malala became at 17 the youngest Nobel Prize winner in history. She was recognized for her efforts in promoting the right to education for women and children in Pakistan. New Zealand continues to mourn one week after a gunman opened fire during prayers at two mosques in Christchurch, killing 50 people. Thousands of people of all faiths gathered in front of one of the mosques to pay their respects to the victims. New Zealand mourns with you. We are one. The prayer was followed by two minutes of silence. One of the mosque's imams thanked people for their support. He said that the terrorist failed in his attempt to tear the nation apart. We are broken hearted, but we are not broken. We are alive. We are together. We are determined to not let anyone divide us. 28-year-old Australian Brenton Tarrant has been charged with murder. He's believed to have legally obtained the guns he used in the attacks. On Thursday, the Prime Minister announced her country was banning the sale and ownership of semi-automatic weapons and assault rifles. NHK World's Madison Watt was at the memorial and files this report. It's been very sombre. There was an immense feeling of sadness among the people attending. One common thing I kept hearing people repeat was, New Zealand, we are one. Another common message among people was how much everyone wanted to show their support for the Muslim community, and that was on full display today. Women that attended, including the Prime Minister, wore a hijab to express their solidarity. We'll need to give them a lot of support to make them realise that they are with us in this community. They live in New Zealand, and this is their home. Since the attack, donations have been flooding in. Local media say more than $6 million has been pledged to organisations that are supporting the victims' families. And when we visited a volunteer group's office, many citizens were bringing in food and daily supplies. Many of the victims were refugees from Asia and the Middle East. And New Zealand has a reputation of trying to create a diverse, inclusive society. People I spoke to say they want to ensure that doesn't change. The two mosques involved in the rampage are being repaired, but it's unclear when they will be reopened. Meanwhile, police are maintaining an increased presence at mosques around the country. People in Thailand vote in a general election this Sunday. The military-led interim government says it has brought stability to the country, pointing to steady economic growth. But as NHK World's Wararita Yemsuda reports, Thais are concerned about the gap between rich and poor. Several makeup projects are underway in Thailand. They include creating special economic zones in the country's east. In the five years of the interim prime minister's reign, Thailand's economy has gone from strength to strength. Growth has been climbing since Prayut Jan Osha took power. This year, it's expected to be around 4%. The government has built infrastructure such as roads and digital platforms to create opportunities for the people. One project the government is pushing forward is a high-speed railway connecting Thailand and southern China. Construction was long delayed due to tight restrictions on foreign engineers. But the prime minister relaxed the rules to let Chinese engineers work on the project. But while the economy is buoyant, the gap between rich and poor is growing. In a recent Credit Suisse survey of 40 countries, Thailand's wealth disparity was the widest. The report indicates 1% of Thailand's population owns 67% of the nation's wealth. And some 21 million temporary employees work on farms and in factories for low pay. Farmers will never prosper. We'll just go on like this. 
It's the government's fault that we can't get out of poverty. Han Sak Benjasi Pitak lives in the northern city of Chiang Mai. He supported former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, who now lives in self-imposed exile. Han Sak has been critical of the government, pointing out that many people in rural areas live in poverty. After the military coup, he was detained several times in a military facility. They confined me to make sure I didn't do anything. Then young soldiers took turns to watch over me. Han Sak says army officers visited his home several times a week after he was released. After the ban on political activities was lifted, when the election campaign started, Han Sak attended a gathering of Thaksin supporters. He says he wants to get back the freedom he once had. I hope to see the day when Thai people acquire full democracy, having rights and being able to act according to one's convictions. Even if Prayut succeeds in holding on to power, the question remains of whether he can spread the economic benefit more fairly in the country. Wadarita was also at a campaign rally for a pro-military party. She gives us a breakdown on the strategies of each party, as well as the latest situation in the election. The Palang Prasarat party has announced several measures targeting low-income earners. This includes universal health care and a minimum wage hike, as well as agricultural subsidies. This is seen as an effort to take votes away from parties loyal to former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, whose support base is mainly made up of poor farmers in the country's north and northeast. But all the rival parties, including the pro Thaksin camp, are pledging populist policies of their own. So it's hard to predict whether the promises will attract new voters to the pro military party. Analysts predict that no single party will win the majority in the 500-member lower house. They expect pro-Taxin parties to win the most, around 180 seats. The pro-military party is forecast to secure about 100. But in the upper house, all 250 seats are effectively handpicked by the military. And the election of the next prime minister is through a vote of members from both houses. That means the pro-military camp still has a big advantage when it comes to selecting the next prime minister. So it's looking like coalition negotiations will be the key after the election. We could see a situation where a third party will have a deciding vote. Analysts are keeping a close eye on the anti-Taksin Democrat Party, which is favoured by middle and upper classes, mainly in urban areas. But no matter what happens, the military's influence over the new government will remain. And how that will work with the country's path back to democracy remains to be seen. Our Warita Yemsuda reporting on the upcoming Thai general election. Japanese department stores saw record spending by overseas visitors last month as Chinese tourists flocked to Japan over the Lunar New Year holidays. Purchases by foreign visitors in February totaled about $290 million, up 14 percent from a year ago. The Japan Department Stores Association says the uptick reflects a growing number of visitors from China and other countries. Overall department store sales rose 0.4 percent from a year ago, the first increase in four months. Okinawa has launched another lawsuit to challenge the central government's plans to relocate a U.S. base within the southern prefecture. But the country's defense minister says it's important that ongoing relocation work doesn't stop. If the issue of relocating the Fatenma air station gets stuck again, that could lead to the base staying where it is permanently. We absolutely need to avoid that situation. Reclamation work is currently underway in Okinawa's Henoko district, and the defense minister says work will proceed as scheduled. Both the U.S. and Japanese governments want to relocate the U.S. Marine Corps Ftemme Air Station there. They say the move is needed because the current base is situated in a densely populated area. But the Okinawa government opposes the plan. It wants the base moved out of the prefecture altogether. 
In its latest back and forth with Tokyo, Okinawa is going to try to get an injunction revoked. The order was issued last October and gave the green light for work to proceed. Earlier this week, Okinawa's governor called on the prime minister to temporarily stop the work to have talks. That request, however, it was rejected. It followed last month's non-binding referendum where 70 percent of voters in Okinawa opposed the reclamation work. A group of women are suing a university in Tokyo for carrying out gender-based discrimination when they applied to medical school. The 33 women filed suit against Tokyo Medical University on Friday. They took and failed the university's entrance exams between 2006 and 2018. Last year, Tokyo Medical University sparked a nationwide scandal after it admitted to lowering the scores of female and older applicants. The plaintiffs are demanding a refund of their exam fees and compensation for gender discrimination for a total of about $1.1 million. This woman in her 20s failed the entrance exam three years in a row. I was appalled to learn the university had blatantly manipulated scores based on gender. She called the manipulations unforgivable, particularly at medical school because it has a direct impact on a person's career. And the freedom to choose one's career is guaranteed by the Japanese constitution. A lawyer representing the woman said she hopes this lawsuit will serve as a step toward eliminating gender discrimination. Representatives of Tokyo Medical University declined to comment, saying they have yet to study the details of the complaint. And now to sports. A Japan-based team is being cut from the Super Rugby League. The league organizer made the announcement on Friday, saying the Sunwolves will be axed from the league after their contract expires in 2020. The organization said the Japan Rugby Football Union reportedly reported in early March that it would no longer be in a position to financially underwrite the team. It said the Japanese side has determined that Super Rugby no longer remains the best pathway for the development of players for the national team. Japan's rugby union called the move quite regrettable. It said monetary demands for a new contract were too steep. Sources say the league organizer was demanding about $9 million. The Sunwolves started playing in the league in 2016 with the hope of making Japan's national team stronger. Meanwhile, Japan is set to play host for rugby's biggest event, the World Cup, six months from now, a first for an Asian country. A Japanese government panel has run through a simulation of a massive eruption of Mount Fuji. It says a blast could send volcanic ash across the wider Tokyo area, disrupting power grids and paralyzing transportation. The panel simulated the impact of a major eruption comparable in scale to one from about 300 years ago. The simulation assumes it would continue for 15 days just like the last time. Wind speeds were based on data from December last year. The panel says total accumulation of ash at the foot of the mountain will be 1.2 meters. Almost 100 kilometers away in Tokyo's busy Shinjuku ward, the panel says there'll be no volcanic ash in the first 12 days. But after that, the area will get up to one millimeter per hour, with a total of about 1.3 centimeters. The simulation shows how the situation will change as time passes. It will help officials think about how they can remove ashes and evacuate people. Panel members say even one millimeter of ash would cause a major slowdown of vehicles. And if there is an accumulation of more than 10 centimeters, vehicles cannot run. If rails are covered with ash, it could also disrupt train services. Experts say people's respiratory systems could also be impacted because of a blast. Next up is our series, Amazing Jobs. We're going to learn about some niche professions you may never have heard of before, but should definitely know about. There are 
それが一つずつ意味を持って存在しているっていうのが好きなんだと思いますこの色いかがでしょうか石丸治と申します、えー、年齢は66歳、えー、どんなことをしているかと言いますと万年筆のインクをブレンドしてお一人お一人のお好みの色を作らせてなるとそういう仕事をしています ちょっと緑っぽいですよね。青いけど緑っぽい。はい。ここ過ぎたかもわからない。あ、もうちょっと青みがかったと思う。もう青みがあるとき。たくさんの色の引き出しを持ってらっしゃるんでしょうねってよく問われるんですけど、もしも僕の引き出しの中には何もないカラッポ
to what we've been seeing into the upper teens across places like Tokyo and mid-teens into Osaka and Fukuoka. But again, snow possible into Saturday and Sunday up into Sapporo before we jump up to around 9 for the high. Meanwhile, we are keeping an eye on a couple of severe tropical cyclones, one near Northern Territory in Queensland and the other located near Western Australia. Take a look at this video coming out of Northern Territory. People are being evacuated in areas that are likely to be hit by this powerful storm named Trevor. So coastal residents are un under alert right now as we also have the concerns of some very strong uh, storm surge possibilities. About 2,000 people have to be taken out from areas that are under threat and it looks like that this storm is likely to make landfall as we head toward the day Saturday. Let's take a look at the track with Trevor, severe tropical cyclone category 3 system likely to become category 4 before it makes landfall and so for those of you in Northern Territory and also extending into Queensland, be prepared as this storm comes on shore through the weekend and makes its way further inland into Northern Territory as we go throughout the weekend. Meanwhile, Veronica, the other severe tropical cyclone, is going to likely maintain its Category 4 status and continue to move its way down toward the south. There's a slow drifter for the moment, but as we go into late Saturday and also into Sunday, this storm is likely to come on shore with very strong winds and storm surge concerns and significantly heavy rainfall. In fact, Veronica may even bring close to 40 millimeters of rainfall into Port Hedland as we go through the weekend. So you want to be prepared for that right now because you're not going to have much time by the time we go through part of the weekend. Places up toward Northern Territory may see anywhere from two to 300 millimeters of rainfall accumulation as we go through Saturday and Sunday. Here's a look at North America, keeping an eye on a low pressure system in the desert southwest has bit of, has brought plenty of thunderstorms into the region and as it moves to the east, likely to continue that into portions of the southern plains as we go through Friday. Meanwhile, toward the east, I mean, it is still a bit of a winter mess, even though we are now in the latter part of March. We're into the spring part, uh, spring month at this point. Sleet and rain into places like New York and also into the New England states with heavy snow and freezing rain possibilities extending into Canada. Yeah, as we go into Friday. Rain from uh, Denver into Seattle and Vancouver from another cold front moving through. Snow into Toronto. Showers from New York into D.C. for Friday. That's a look at your forecast. Hope you have a good day wherever you are. We invite you to follow NHK World on Facebook, Twitter, and also by downloading the NHK World app. For all of us here on the show, thanks for watching. Choice of the day. Asia Insight. Dining with the chef. Cook around Japan, Fukushima. We explore new developments in Fukushima cuisine. Changing society through art. Message from Tamiji Kitagawa. Japan to the world, NHK World Japan.
Kuromon Ichiba Market is in Osaka, Japan's second largest city. With more than 30,000 visitors a day, it has become a popular spot for inbound tourists. This market, because we heard there was a lot of just beautiful seafood to come and look at and see, and we're just going to kind of shop around and see, see what all was here. The market temporarily lost its business following last year's typhoon. But it made a relatively quick recovery, and many tourists are again visiting it as a place to enjoy the energetic atmosphere of a Japanese traditional market. At that time, the market was empty and no one visited us, so we had a hard time selling anything. Now the foreigners have returned, and the number of Japanese visitors is also going up. We warmly welcome foreign visitors, so we want the market to be something they will look forward to when they visit Japan. How does Japan approach rehabilitation and reconstruction in the aftermath of natural disasters? We would like to introduce Japan's efforts to become a more resilient and safer country based on the lessons learned from disasters. I'm here at Kansai International Airport, the gateway to some of Japan's top tourist destinations, such as Osaka and Kyoto. This is one of the busiest airports in the nation, and it handles over 28 million passengers every year. In the summer of 2018, major typhoons and earthquakes hit many parts of Japan, causing considerable damage. This airport was also closed down temporarily due to a typhoon. But thanks to the efforts of many people, damage was kept to a minimum and a full recovery was quickly achieved. On September the 4th, 2018, Typhoon Jebi hit Western Japan. Located on a man-made island, Kansai International Airport was inundated by high waves and suffered a blackout. It had to be closed due to damage caused to the road and rail bridge connecting the airport and the mainland. The effects of the typhoon were brought under control the following day, September the 5th. West Nippon Expressway Company, which manages the bridge, was able to reopen the road using the three lanes on the undamaged side. We were prepared to make the bridge passable right after the typhoon. I think we were able to manage it because in our daily training, we always confirm that we should make it available in the shortest possible time. Removal of the seawater, which had flooded the runways, continued around the clock using 10 large pump trucks. Restoration of the underground electrical facilities was also carried out promptly. Thanks to these efforts, only three days later, the domestic airlines reopened some of their operations. And the international airlines followed suit the next day. Meanwhile, a giant floating crane was used to remove the damaged bridge girders. Luckily, we could use a floating crane which was anchored at the port of Kobe, which is not so far from the airport. I think that was the biggest factor behind the rapid removal of the girders. 
Along with the removal of the bridge girders, full-scale restoration work on the railway lines was carried out. The railway bridge had actually been moved about 50 centimeters in a horizontal direction. So we fixed a jack under the abutment, applied weight to it and returned it to the original position slowly and carefully. I think everyone was really united as one in taking on this urgent mission. Railway operations resumed on September the 18th, two weeks after the typhoon. Thanks to the efforts made by a great number of people involved in the airport business, Kansai International Airport reopened fully on September the 21st, 17 days after being closed. It is now in the process of improving its disaster prevention measures even more. The most important lesson we learned is the need to prevent the airport from being flooded in such a way again. To achieve that, we're verifying the cause of the immersion during the typhoon, and we have started work on raising the seawall as necessary. We strongly feel that we must make the airport more resilient against various natural disasters, including not only typhoons, but also earthquakes and tsunamis. In February 2019, the 70th Sapporo Snow Festival was held in Sapporo, the heart of the island of Hokkaido. There was a record number of 2,737,000 visitors. Just five months earlier, on September the 6th, 2018, Hokkaido was struck by an earthquake that caused a large-scale blackout. Airlines and railways stopped operations, which caused a lot of trouble for tourists. The city of Sapporo temporarily provided emergency shelters for tourists to stay at. I think that was a good arrangement. And many of the city's hotels opened up their lobbies and banquet rooms and prepared meals for tourists in cases where they were unable to find vacant rooms. A general merchandise store in Sapporo also gave active support, such as providing battery chargers for the smartphones of foreign tourists. To help stranded foreign tourists, we provided a space for them to rest and battery chargers for their smartphones. And we offered food, such as snacks and sausages. We received many questions about the status of flights, so we also acted as a kind of liaison service, making inquiries to the airport and the airline companies. The Hokkaido Electric Power Company started working on the restoration of power right away. First, using electricity generated by a hydroelectric power plant as a pilot light, the company secured the power required for a thermal electric power plant, which can generate huge amounts of electricity, and resume the generation of electric power in sequence. Then, by resuming the power supply from Honshu, the main island of Japan as well, the company achieved a full restoration of power 45 hours after the blackout. We are all determined to secure countermeasures to avoid the entire region suffering a blackout if an earthquake of a similar size as this time hits Hokkaido in the future. We also want to enhance our workers' skills even more using the lessons we learned from this experience. The Hokkaido Electric Power Company completed the construction of a new thermal electric power plant in February 2019. And in March, the electric power cable connecting Hokkaido and Honshu will be fortified in order to enhance power interchange. The company is steadily developing blackout prevention measures. In the summer of 2018, a wide area of western Japan, including Hiroshima Prefecture, was hit by torrential rain and landslides, which caused a lot of damage. Whenever a natural disaster strikes in Japan, 
a disaster control headquarters is immediately set up and instructions for rescue activities and arrangements for relief supplies are initiated. Using the shelter support system, a centralization of information about relief goods is established between municipalities, the prefectures and the national government. The cities, towns, prefecture and government could simultaneously check the items required by the disaster-stricken areas on the same screen. So we could deliver relief goods without any overlapping by asking the government to provide items that the prefecture couldn't provide. The relief goods stored in the disaster supply warehouses of the municipalities, prefectures and the government are transported to disaster-stricken areas by transportation companies designated in advance. Several transportation companies like us are designated to deliver goods whenever this kind of natural disaster happens. We are always responsible for transport when an emergency arises. The designated transportation companies promptly delivered relief goods to the disaster-stricken areas. We've accumulated know-how from various disasters, such as the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and the 2016 Kumamoto earthquakes. For that reason, we could plan and act very swiftly. Convenience stores are also playing an increasingly valuable role in supporting the lives of people in disaster-stricken areas. We provided drinking water and hot noodles as initial emergency support. And the government gave our vehicles permission to drive on roads which were closed to traffic in order to deliver relief goods. I believe that was vital for ensuring prompt delivery. As a franchise, we were fully supported by the company headquarters. That, that meant we could operate without any worries. I think that was very important. In the case of the heavy rain event of July 2018, drones were efficiently used in the restoration work. The survey work specialist, Terra Drone, conducted laser measurements using drones at 15 sites, especially in areas with urgent needs where it was difficult to do surveys on the ground. One drone flight could survey the land features of a stricken area and provide accurate 3D topography data. The data enabled a clear understanding of exactly how much earth and sand had flowed in landslides and how much surface soil had been removed in the surrounding area. This facilitated prompt restoration work. First, we investigated the changes in geographical features by comparing the situation before and after the damage caused by the landslide. A drone can acquire equable data of a higher density than a conventional ground survey, making it possible for us to work out a more accurate execution scheme for recovery. The island of Miyajima is a famous tourist spot in Hiroshima Prefecture. The number of inbound tourists temporarily decreased, but they soon returned and the island has become busy again. Leonard Meyer came to Japan from Germany in 1993 and has been working in the country ever since. He is active as a property investment consultant. In Japan, people are prepared to actually, it's not being neglected. Earthquakes do happen and everyone is aware about this fact and everyone is then also participating when there is an earthquake drill for example in this building yeah people are actually leaving the office and putting their pens down and uh, pencils down and closing their uh, laptops and move out of the building in order to participate i think this is a very important thing that this awareness and this commitment to prevent or to recover and to to drill and to practice how to react in case of an earthquake. This 
country has experienced numerous natural disasters over the years, which have taught it how to deal with them. Based on these lessons, Japan has steadily been improving the know-how and technologies required to avoid disasters and reduce their impact. Based on the lessons learned from earthquakes in the past, Japan designs buildings following the highest level of world quake resistance standards. The major Japanese construction company, Kajima Corporation, has developed HIDAX R, a device to mitigate seismic motion. It helps to stop oscillation by temporarily storing the vibration energy caused by an earthquake as hydraulic energy in an auxiliary tank. This is a simulation using the recorded data from the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. It shows what happens with a regular steel device for mitigating seismic motion. Compared with that, Hydaxar halves the oscillation of a high-rise building and reduces the time before oscillation calms down to about one-tenth. It's a device for the mitigation of seismic motion of the world's highest standard. The purpose of conventional earthquake-resistant design was to create safe buildings which wouldn't collapse. But we have focused on developing technology to mitigate seismic motion by reducing oscillation, and it's been highly evaluated. Hydaxar can be embedded in the walls of a building in a compact manner. It's already being used in six high-rise buildings in the Tokyo metropolitan area. Carbon fiber resembling rope has been introduced as a new material for seismic strengthening. Fabric manufacturer Komatsu Matere has developed a new material called Kabelkoma strand rod. A combination of special resin and carbon fiber, its shape can be changed when heat is applied. Condensation and rust resistant, as well as being very strong and light, the material is attracting attention in the construction field worldwide as a new material for seismic strengthening. The Kyozo, a repository of precious Buddhist scriptures at Zenkoji Temple in Nagano, is designated as a Japanese important cultural property. It was constructed in the middle of the 18th century. When the Kyozo was being renovated, Kabokomo strand rod was used in the seismic strengthening work its characteristics of being light, easy to handle, and involving less risk of damage to wooden materials compared to other materials have been well received. Over 5,000 structures in Japan are designated as important cultural properties, including many national treasures. Many people have commented that this material has been long awaited. We're now trying to raise awareness of it by increasing actual examples of use so that whoever visits those sites, Japanese and foreign customers alike, can rest assured. Komatsu Matere asked for the advice of prominent Japanese architect Kengo Kuma when its old HQ building was being renovated. Kabokoma strand rod was used to add earthquake resistance, resulting in a building with excellent design qualities. Kabokoma strand rod is expected to be certified by Japanese industrial standards as a seismic strengthening material within 2019, and there are high hopes for its diffusion. In February 2017, Paul Spanswick from Britain assumed the post of Senior Managing Director of Nomura Holdings, a leading Japanese securities company. Well, I think Japan is, first of all, renowned for its expertise in technological innovation. And I think the car industry or the bullet train system are two very good examples you know, of that. I think if you, if you have that coupled with the quality of the infrastructure, that I think sets Japan apart from you know, other countries in the world, plus its experience of, of dealing with natural disasters. You know, I think I would expect Japan to continue to play a leading role in the development of technology that both helps detect 
and also mitigate um, any impact of any natural disasters that might occur. Yokohama Station, south of Tokyo, handles around 2.3 million passengers a day. The underground mall stretching to the west of the station has never been flooded, but there is a real danger of submergence as the area is surrounded by several rivers. To help prevent that, area rain has been developed. It's a system in which flood detection sensors are installed at six places in the rivers and two places in drainage channels around the west area of Yokohama. When the water level rises, they send information immediately to the smartphone of the mall administrator. This development was led by Professor Wataru Kobayashi of Tokyo Denki University. For places vulnerable to water disasters, such as underground malls and stations in particular, a decision must be made on where people can be evacuated and which entrance and exit should be closed first. In order to make decisions properly, those places use a new style of sensor that directly detects river overflows or water which can't be discharged and dispatches a warning. Area rain provides detailed flood information and rainfall data for the two square kilometer area around the west part of Yokohama Station, caught by the country's high performance radar every 250 square meters. Currently at the trial stage, the system is garnering attention as an effective flooding countermeasure in urban areas. Area rain is being used by 80 people responsible for disaster prevention at facilities in this area. Regarding a prompt response to disasters, it's the first strike that decides the battle. And I think simulations using this system will give us a clear picture. So I'm sure we won't be late applying flooding countermeasures. Urban areas have recently had to face unexpected floods triggered by localized torrential rain, also known as guerrilla rain in Japan. A system has been developed which can predict downpours about 30 minutes in advance and issue immediate warnings. It's supported by multi-parameter phased array weather radar. This radar takes about 30 seconds to obtain a view of the movements of cumulonimbus clouds, compared with the five minutes taken by conventional radar. As the result, it forecasts the risk of heavy rain or tornadoes with great accuracy. The forecast data can be checked on an individual smartphone in real time. The National Research Institute for Earth Science and Disaster Resilience. Koyuru Iwanami, one of the researchers, says future research will make it possible to predict torrential rain one hour before it happens. Numerical weather prediction is a method to reconstruct the atmosphere and predict the weather using mathematical models. The radar data is directly used to predict the short-term weather. Based on the results of this numerical weather prediction, we are now working on predictions of torrential rain occurring within the next 30 minutes or one hour. It is hoped that this prediction data will be used to enhance safety during the 2020 Summer Olympic and Paralympic Games. <music> Professor Ana Maria Cruz from Colombia has been studying disaster prevention at a university in Japan. We asked her for her thoughts on Japanese disaster prevention efforts. I think Anyone that is working in this field looks up to Japan to, to learn from, from all the achievements that Japan has had in reducing the number of people that have been killed, in the way it's investing, it has invested in disaster reduction. And you can see that because there are quickly changes to the regulations to the plans, for example, the Japan uh, Basic Act for Disaster Risk Reduction, 
has been amended uh, every time there's a big disaster to, I guess, to accommodate the lessons from, from the disaster. How can visitors from abroad acquire information when a disaster occurs in Japan? Efforts are now being made at various locations throughout Japan to dispatch disaster information in several different languages. The Tokaido Shinkansen bullet train service connects Tokyo and Osaka. At the concourse of major stations, announcements about the operation service are made in English, and they will be done in Chinese and Korean as well in the future. Currently, Westbound trains of the Tokaido Shinkansen are delayed by up to 15 minutes due to rain. In addition to that, at every station of the Tokaido Shinkansen, station staff responsible for helping inbound tourists respond to their inquiries with the help of mobile devices, which can translate into 74 languages. Departures at 9.37. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Applications which compile useful information during disasters are also available. One of them is safety tips provided by the Japan Tourism Agency. Its functions include an earthquake early warning. This function gives warning of the arrival of a big earthquake shock from a few seconds to several tens of seconds in advance. At JNTO, we steadily enhance the provision of information to inbound tourists. When a natural disaster occurs, links to the relevant company websites are uploaded on our English Global website to offer information on the operation status of transportation facilities, including airports, railways, and expressways, as well as Wi-Fi availability. JNTO has launched Japan Safe Travel, a new official Twitter account. It dispatches a variety of disaster-related information. In addition, it has newly opened Japan Visitor Hotline, offering tourists consultations in English, Chinese or Korean 24 hours a day throughout the year. The JNTO Tourist Information Center, located in Marunouchi, central Tokyo, has improved its capacity to respond to disasters. Smartphone battery chargers, halal certified emergency food, and pointing dialogue booklets are always provided ready for emergencies. The Ritz-Carlton Osaka Hotel was affected by the typhoon in 2018. We asked the general manager, Christopher Clark, about Japan's disaster management efforts. I think that the best thing any country can do, which Japan has done, is give confidence to uh, you know, the consumer, to the guest. And I, I believe you know, living through these types of incidents that the, the government has done that, um, businesses have done that, um, I can't tell you how many stories I heard from, from guests that went through these situations in Japan. And so I think it's not exclusive to Japan, but it's how the, the country reacts, deals with it, and the confidence that you give to your guests. The number of foreign tourists traveling to Japan has been increasing rapidly, and it has already exceeded 30 million visitors per year. The country will also be hosting the 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games, as well as the Osaka Kansai Japan Expo in 2025. Japan's resilience to natural disasters is growing stronger, as are its efforts to ensure that people from all around the world can feel safe and secure when visiting. Uh, I love Japan. It's my second time here. Um, yeah, just love the, the people, the culture, the food. Yeah, just eating, eating and drinking everywhere we go. So, yeah.
This program was made possible by the Government of Japan. It's a Friday night here in Japan. I'm James Tengan in Tokyo. This is NHK Newsline. We begin on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's Unification Ministry says North Korea has pulled out of a joint liaison office. It says Pyongyang has ordered all staff to leave. The facility opened last September and was a sign of improving ties between the countries. The South Korean government regrets North Korea's decision to withdraw, but remains hopeful the country will return in the near future and run the joint liaison office properly, as outlined in the agreement between the North and the South. Pyongyang's move may be an attempt to get the South to play a more active role in matters concerning the two Koreas and the U.S. An article posted Friday on a North Korean website was critical of the South, saying peace on the peninsula should be brought about by the two countries, not by a third party. The article accused South Korean authorities of failing to take practical steps that would fundamentally improve North-South relations. It called on Seoul to make demands on the U.S. After the second U.S.-North Korea summit ended without an agreement, South Korea said it would mediate between Pyongyang and Washington. The South also said it would provide assistance to the North within the framework of the international sanctions against Pyongyang. Meanwhile, the U.S. government has imposed sanctions on two Chinese shipping companies for violating U.N. Security Council sanctions resolutions on North Korea. It's the first such move since last month's Hanoi summit. The Treasury Department says one of the companies provided goods to a North Korean firm that's affiliated with Pyongyang's spy agency. It said the other enabled North Korean officials in Europe to purchase goods. The sanctions prohibit U.S. dealings with the designated companies and freezes their U.S. assets. The department also released a list of 67 vessels that it says engaged in illicit ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers or exported North Korean coal. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin reiterated that the full implementation of U.N. resolutions is crucial to achieving the full denuclearization of North Korea. Last month, Trump and Kim left Hanoi without a deal on the issue. Since then, Pyongyang has said there's no justification for maintaining full sanctions and that it may suspend negotiations with the U.S. But Washington has urged North Korea to continue talks. Staying with North Korea, state-run media say the country's National Assembly will meet on April 11th in Pyongyang. The Supreme People's Assembly decides the national budget law revisions, and personnel appointments. Earlier this month, 687 deputies were elected in the so-called vote. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was not on the ballot, and no explanation was given why. But there is growing speculation that he might be appointed to a new post. The new parliamentary session is expected to focus on rebuilding the economy as it continues to cope with a wide range of international sanctions. Meanwhile, sources say a top aide to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has been in Moscow since Tuesday. Kim chang son who is known as Kim Jong-un's butler, also visited Singapore and Vietnam ahead of the U.S.-North Korea summits. Russian President Vladimir Putin has previously invited the North Korean leader to visit Russia. So observers say the top aide's trip could indicate an upcoming summit between the two leaders. Nobel Peace Prize laureate and women's rights activist Malala Yousafzai is visiting Japan for the first time. She'll attend an international conference here in Tokyo. Malala met on Friday with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. She told him she's convinced that Japan can promote women's empowerment and education across the world.
Unfortunately, 130 million girls are out of school today. Millions more are unprepared for the modern workforce. And to solve this problem, we need the support of individuals, businesses and governments. Malala will deliver a speech on Saturday at the two-day World Assembly for Women, an event sponsored by the Japanese government. She plans to speak about the importance of education and hold discussions with other female leaders. Among them will be UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. Malala became at 17 the youngest Nobel Prize winner in history. She was recognized for efforts in promoting the right to education for women and children in Pakistan. New Zealand continues to mourn one week after a gunman opened fire during prayers at two mosques in Christchurch, killing 50 people. Thousands of people of all faiths gathered in front of one of the mosques to pay their respects to the victims. New Zealand mourns with you. We are one. The prayer was followed by two minutes of silence. One of the mosque's imams thanked people for their support. He said that the terrorist failed in his attempt to tear the nation apart. We are broken hearted, but we are not broken. We are alive. We are together. We are determined to not let anyone divide us. 28-year-old Australian Brenton Tarrant has been charged with murder. He's believed to have legally obtained the guns he used in the attacks. On Thursday, the Prime Minister announced her country was banning the sale and ownership of semi-automatic weapons and assault rifles. NHK World's Madison Watt was at the memorial and files this report. It's been very sombre. There was an immense feeling of sadness among the people attending. One common thing I kept hearing people repeat was, New Zealand, we are one. Another common message among people was how much everyone wanted to show their support for the Muslim community, and that was on full display today. Women that attended, including the Prime Minister, wore a hijab to express their solidarity. We'll need to give them a lot of support to make them realise that they are with us in this community. They live in New Zealand, and this is their home. Since the attack, donations have been flooding in. Local media say more than $6 million has been pledged to organisations that are supporting the victims' families. And when we visited a volunteer group's office, many citizens were bringing in food and daily supplies. Many of the victims were refugees from Asia and the Middle East. And New Zealand has a reputation of trying to create a diverse, inclusive society. People I spoke to say they want to ensure that doesn't change. The two mosques involved in the rampage are being repaired, but it's unclear when they will be reopened. Meanwhile, police are maintaining an increased presence at mosques around the country. People in Thailand vote in a general election this Sunday. The military-led interim government says it has brought stability to the country, pointing to steady economic growth. But as NHK World's Wararita Yemsuda reports, Thais are concerned about the gap between rich and poor. Several makeup projects are underway in Thailand. They include creating special economic zones in the country's east. In the five years of the interim prime minister's reign, Thailand's economy has gone from strength to strength. Growth has been climbing since Prayut Jan Osha took power. This year, it's expected to be around 4%. The government has built infrastructure such as roads and digital platforms to create opportunities for the people. One project the government is pushing forward is a high-speed railway connecting Thailand and southern China. Construction was long delayed due to tight restrictions on foreign engineers. But the prime minister relaxed the rules to let Chinese engineers work on the project. But while the economy is buoyant, the gap between rich and poor is growing. In a recent Credit Suisse survey of 40 countries, Thailand's wealth disparity was the widest. The report indicates 1% of Thailand's population owns 67% of the nation's wealth. And some 21 million temporary employees work on farms and in factories for low pay. Farmers will never prosper. We'll just go on like this. 
It's the government's fault that we can't get out of poverty. Han Sak Benjasi Pitak lives in the northern city of Chiang Mai. He supported former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, who now lives in self-imposed exile. Han Sak has been critical of the government, pointing out that many people in rural areas live in poverty. After the military coup, he was detained several times in a military facility. They confined me to make sure I didn't do anything. Then young soldiers took turns to watch over me. Han Sak says army officers visited his home several times a week after he was released. After the ban on political activities was lifted, when the election campaign started, Han Sak attended a gathering of Thaksin supporters. He says he wants to get back the freedom he once had. I hope to see the day when Thai people acquire full democracy, having rights and being able to act according to one's convictions. Even if Prayut succeeds in holding on to power, the question remains of whether he can spread the economic benefit more fairly in the country. Wadarita was also at a campaign rally for a pro-military party. She gives us a breakdown on the strategies of each party, as well as the latest situation in the election. The Palang Prasarat party has announced several measures targeting low-income earners. This includes universal health care and a minimum wage hike, as well as agricultural subsidies. This is seen as an effort to take votes away from parties loyal to former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, whose support base is mainly made up of poor farmers in the country's north and northeast. But all the rival parties, including the pro Thaksin camp, are pledging populist policies of their own. So it's hard to predict whether the promises will attract new voters to the pro military party. Analysts predict that no single party will win the majority in the 500-member lower house. They expect pro-Taksin parties to win the most, around 180 seats. The pro-military party is forecast to secure about 100. But in the upper house, all 250 seats are effectively handpicked by the military. And the election of the next prime minister is through a vote of members from both houses. That means the pro-military camp still has a big advantage when it comes to selecting the next prime minister. So it's looking like coalition negotiations will be the key after the election. We could see a situation where a third party will have a deciding vote. Analysts are keeping a close eye on the anti-Taksin Democrat Party, which is favoured by middle and upper classes, mainly in urban areas. But no matter what happens, the military's influence over the new government will remain. And how that will work with the country's path back to democracy remains to be seen. Our Wadarita Yemsud are reporting on the upcoming Thai general election. Japanese department stores saw record spending by overseas visitors last month as Chinese tourists flocked to Japan over the Lunar New Year holidays. Purchases by foreign visitors in February totaled about $290 million, up 14 percent from a year ago. The Japan Department Stores Association says the uptick reflects a growing number of visitors from China and other countries. Overall department store sales rose 0.4 percent from a year ago, the first increase in four months. Okinawa has launched another lawsuit to challenge the central government's plans to relocate a U.S. base within the southern prefecture. But the country's defense minister says it's important that ongoing relocation work doesn't stop. If the issue of relocating the Fatenma air station gets stuck again, that could lead to the base staying where it is permanently. We absolutely need to avoid that situation. Reclamation work is currently underway in Okinawa's Henoko district, and the defense minister says work will proceed as scheduled. Both the U.S. and Japanese governments want to relocate the U.S. Marine Corps Futenma Air Station there. They say the move is needed because the current base is situated in a densely populated area. But the Okinawa government opposes the plan. It wants the base moved out of the prefecture altogether. 
In its latest back and forth with Tokyo, Okinawa is going to try to get an injunction revoked. The order was issued last October and gave the green light for work to proceed. Earlier this week, Okinawa's governor called on the prime minister to temporarily stop the work to have talks. That request, however, it was rejected. It followed last month's non-binding referendum where 70 percent of voters in Okinawa opposed the reclamation work. A group of women are suing a university in Tokyo for carrying out gender-based discrimination when they applied to medical school. The 33 women filed suit against Tokyo Medical University on Friday. They took and failed the university's entrance exams between 2006 and 2018. Last year, Tokyo Medical University sparked a nationwide scandal after it admitted to lowering the scores of female and older applicants. The plaintiffs are demanding a refund of their exam fees and compensation for gender discrimination for a total of about $1.1 million. This woman in her 20s failed the entrance exam three years in a row. I was appalled to learn the university had blatantly manipulated scores based on gender. She called the manipulations unforgivable, particularly at medical school, because it has a direct impact on a person's career. And the freedom to choose one's career is guaranteed by the Japanese constitution. A lawyer representing the woman said she hopes this lawsuit will serve as a step toward eliminating gender discrimination. Representatives of Tokyo Medical University declined to comment, saying they have yet to study the details of the complaint. And now to sports. A Japan-based team is being cut from the Super Rugby League. The league organizer made the announcement on Friday, saying the Sun Wolves will be axed from the league after their contract expires in 2020. The organization said the Japan Rugby Football Union reportedly reported in early March that it would no longer be in a position to financially underwrite the team. It said the Japanese side has determined that Super Rugby no longer remains the best pathway for the development of players for the national team. Japan's rugby union called the move quite regrettable. It said monetary demands for a new contract were too steep. Sources say the league organizer was demanding about $9 million. The Sun Wolves started playing in the league in 2016 with the hope of making Japan's national team stronger. Meanwhile, Japan is set to play host for rugby's biggest event, the World Cup, six months from now, a first for an Asian country. A Japanese government panel has run through a simulation of a massive eruption of Mount Fuji. It says a blast could send volcanic ash across the wider Tokyo area, disrupting power grids and paralyzing transportation. The panel simulated the impact of a major eruption comparable in scale to one from about 300 years ago. The simulation assumes it would continue for 15 days, just like the last time. Wind speeds were based on data from December last year. The panel says total accumulation of ash at the foot of the mountain will be 1.2 meters. Almost 100 kilometers away in Tokyo's busy Shinjuku ward, the panel says there'll be no volcanic ash in the first 12 days. But after that, the area will get up to one millimeter per hour, with a total of about 1.3 centimeters. The simulation shows how the situation will change as time passes. It will help officials think about how they can remove ashes and evacuate people. Panel members say even one millimeter of ash would cause a major slowdown of vehicles. And if there is an accumulation of more than 10 centimeters, vehicles cannot run. If rails are covered with ash, it could also disrupt train services. Experts say people's respiratory systems could also be impacted because of a blast. Next up is our series, Amazing Jobs. We're going to learn about some niche professions you may never have heard of before, but should definitely know about. There are many 
それが一つずつ意味を持って存在しているっていうのが好きなんだと思いますこの色いかがでしょうか石丸おさむと申します、えー、年齢は66歳、えー、どんなことをしているかと言いますと万年筆のインクをブレンドしてお一人お一人のお好みの色を作らせてなるとそういう仕事をしていますイメージはい,い,いですかどうぞおかけくださいどんなどんな色にしましょうか。宮島の海の色。宮島の海っぽい感じって。宮島の海の。<笑><笑>おお、これですよね。はい、まあ瀬戸内海ですから青々としたって感じでもないですよね。はい、やってみましょう。お願いします。初デートが宮島だったんですよ。<笑><笑>あの淡い海の色が表現できるんなら。かっこいいなぁと思う。ありがとうございます。緑<笑>。ちょっと緑っぽいですよね。青いけど緑っぽい。はいはい。一個目のカラーにしましょう。はい。緑すぎたかもからな。青。もうちょっと青みがかった。もうちょっと青みがかった。たくさんの色の引き出しを持ってらっしゃるんでしょうねってよく問われるんですけど、むしろ僕の。引き出しの中には何もない空っぽだと言った方がいいんだと思います僕はお客様の心あるいは頭の中にある色をですねこの広い範囲から手探りで丁寧に掘り出すような作業をお手伝いしている仕事だというふうに思ってますからはいあ,あ,あ,あ、いい感じあ、あ、あ,あ、いいね綺麗ね,ね、すごい素敵<笑>まあラブレター価格の危機かな。すごいな。すごい。じゃあお互いにお手紙書きます。ちょっかんだけ黒を入れてもらう。黒を入れる。はい。自分海上自衛隊の人間なんですけど。あの世界一周の航海にこの間帰ってきたばっかなんですけど。でのの日本に帰ってきた時の海の色がやっぱ海外の海の色と違ってその色を作りたいなと思っているか色というものが具体的にこうだっていうのがあるようで本当は夢のような感じでですね確かに見たはずなんだけど掴みきれてないと言いますかね。思い出だったり今置かれている状況だったりっていうのがですねすごいこの入ってきてできているものだろうと思うんですよものすごい楽しいですね<笑>新色が毎日毎日生まれていくわけですでその出来上がったものは他にないんだというそれを探すこと自体が僕の楽しみだからだと思います<音楽>はい。But cooler air is coming in with some more precipitation up toward the north as we go through the day Saturday. We have a cold front that's pushing through, and that's rolling through, and behind it, plenty of cold air, and that's going to help drop down those temperatures. Now, we have a low pressure system that's departing from the north, and that's still going to bring in a northerly wind. That flow will bring in the possibility of bringing snow. Yes, snow as we go through the weekend. So, for those of you in Hokkaido, you're still. Dealing with the chilly weather, and you will be dealing with some of that snow. We're looking at relatively dry weather as we go for the rest of the country through the weekend, and then we'll have temperatures moving back up 
to what we've been seeing into the upper teens across places like Tokyo and mid-teens into Osaka and Fukuoka. But again, snow possible into Saturday and Sunday up into Sapporo before we jump up to around 9 for the high. Meanwhile, we are keeping an eye on a couple of severe tropical cyclones, one near Northern Territory in Queensland and the other located near Western Australia. Take a look at this video coming out of Northern Territory. People are being evacuated in areas that are likely to be hit by this powerful storm named Trevor. So coastal residents are un under alert right now as we also have the concerns of some very strong uh, storm surge possibilities. About 2,000 people have to be taken out from areas that are under threat and it looks like that this storm is likely to make landfall as we head toward the day Saturday. Let's take a look at the track with Trevor, severe tropical cyclone category 3 system likely to become category 4 before it makes landfall and so for those of you in Northern Territory and also extending into Queensland, be prepared as this storm comes on shore through the weekend and makes its way further inland into Northern Territory as we go throughout the week.